Hey, what's up? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. Ken Luz here, brand new book, The Hidden Girl from Simon & Schuster. What's going on, man? How are you? All right. Thank you very much for having me. Doing well. You got it. So you have uh, camped out in this whole sci-fi world, short story world. Why don't you tell people about the latest book and how it all came together? together? Sure. So uh, this is the book, The Hidden Girl and Other Stories. It, comes right. out from, um, it came out from uh, Simon & Schuster. Um, and... Uh, I have published over 150 short stories by this point. Um, and I had one previous, uh, previous collection called The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories. And this is the second one. Um, it basically collects some of my newer stories. Uh, and the overall theme is about how do we remain human in the face of cataclysmic change. I mean, that's certainly something that applies to what's going on today. So what were some of the deeper layers that you really thought about with what's going on in your story? No kidding. No kidding. I mean, <laughs> when I wrote these stories, I wasn't thinking specifically of pandemics, uh, even though a lot of other writers uh, were exploring the concept. Um, what I try to focus on really is the way technology is changing the way we um, define what it means to be human and, and how do we react to that. Um, so one example would be, the way technology is, is changing the definition of what it means to know something. Um, nowadays, when we say we know something, what we really mean is we have an idea of where to look it up uh, because looking up information has become so effortless and so frictionless. We often think that we know something, but in fact, all we know is how to look it up. Uh, I was a practicing lawyer for um, many years, and uh, this is very obvious in the legal world where you can't actually draft anything from scratch anymore. What you do is you take a form and then you modify it. So when you're moving around between firms or between jobs, if you can't take the forms with you, you sort of feel like you've lost a huge part of your brain. Literally, you just, you can't even do your job. Uh, and I wanted to explore this idea of, of, of our externalization of our knowledge, of our sense of identity, the way we put so much of it out into the electronic world, the digital world, uh, and where the logical uh, destination for that trend is. A lot of the stories explore this concept of the singularity, which is the idea that we literally become digital beings with most of our mental processes in the digital realm. And what does that mean? How do you remain human in a world like that? Yeah, I think it's really fascinating, especially with social media. You put a version of yourself out there. It's mostly the best version of what's going on in your life. And now's the perfect time where it's like, there's not really a ton to share, except if you're doing new stuff. So what do you think is most difficult for people when they are putting out that certain image? Do you think it reveals more about them in terms of what's going on in their life? Or like, what piques your curiosity about just this whole digital identity in general? It, it really is interesting. I mean, what I think is interesting about the digital um, self, self presentation is that it's, it's really causing all of us to rethink the whole idea of having a single, a single um, unitary identity. Uh, in the digital realm, I think all of us are very comfortable with the idea that we present different identities to different groups. Uh, the way, and, and, you know, this is a very old cliche, the way you present yourself on LinkedIn is very different from Facebook, from mm -hmm. Twitter, from Instagram. You, you have multiple different selves. Um, the, 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 the issue is maybe we have always been like that. We've mm -hmm. always code switched between different communities. Uh, the way your friends from grade school know you is very different from the way folks in college know you, which is very different from the way people at your first job know you. Um, and, and the digital identity concept just makes all that so much more clear, brings so much of that to the surface. Uh, you, you really can see yourself being locked into this image you're projecting to the world through different um, digital channels. And, and then it becomes more difficult over time to reconcile yourself, you know, which one actually is you. And um, if, if uh, maybe that's even the wrong question, maybe, maybe the whole concept of having a unitary self uh, is, is the wrong way to think about it. Um, and it's the multitude of identities that really, um, and, and the way we mediate and, and try to balance between them all, that leads us to, 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 to have the sense of self. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And you make a great point about how we do this in real life. And you, know, you hit on something before where it's like, we know how to find things now. We don't necessarily know things. So you think the good outweighs the bad. It feels like we know a lot just about a few different or a, a lot of different things, a little bit about a lot of different things. And like for you as a lawyer, like you went all in on certain things. So how do you kind of weigh the pros and the cons there? 
Well, it, it's, it's kind of a difficult question, right? I mean, I don't think it's a simple matter of whether it's all good or bad. I think technology ultimately is just a, a force multiplier for human nature. So it amplifies the capacity for all of us to do good uh, as well as the capacity to do evil um, in, the, in the same way that any, you know, in the old days before <clears throat> the internet, it was very difficult for somebody with very outrageous, dangerous, radical ideas to make anything happen. It's very hard for them to find like-minded individuals to become a movement. And nowadays, you know, radicali radicalization is a very significant problem on, in, on the internet because people can find these extremist views um, and find like-minded individuals to, be, to, 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 to feel the sense of community. So it amplifies the, the nature for us to do destruction. But at the same time, folks who are trying to do good can find like-minded individuals as well. And, um, and, and we can do, each individual now has more capacity to do good, to influence the world for good uh, than ever before. So ultimately, it's a, it's a matter of amplifying everyone's capacity um, to do whatever it is they want to do. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is this idea that all of us now have a knowledge that's more broad rather than deep is also interesting. A lot of us now know a little bit about lots of things and then very deeply just about a few topics. What is interesting to me though is if you do know, uh, do go very deeply into a few narrow topics and then you look at the, so, the social media commentary or the mainstream um, media reporting on these topics, you often find errors. Um, it's not that the folks who are doing the reporting are, are deliberately trying to, not trying to get it right. It's just very difficult for known specialists to get these specialized things right. So I know a lot about the law. So when I look at legal coverage, often I, I see things that are just not set properly and not being done right. So, but, but on other, lots of other topics, I don't know that much. And I just sort of take what's being said um, as the truth. And now I sort of, we all have to sort of reflect back on that and, and realize that the way a lot of us get information is probably not necessarily correct because all of us are getting it from a popularized account rather than kind of the deep knowledge that specialists have. Um, it's, it's, the, it, it's, it's this fundamental problem we have of distrusting expertise and authority in, in society. But all of us are experts in something. And if we know for a, fa for, for a fact that the common con conventional wisdom in whatever topic it is that we are deeply knowledgeable about is wrong, then chances are our adherence to conventional wisdom in other areas in which we don't know a lot is likely wrong too. So I, I think the, the lesson is we need to be more humble about the fact that we know a lot. We know a little bit about lots of things. Doesn't mean we actually understand them deeply to make informed decisions. We need to be a little bit more humble in the way we approach the world. Yeah, get past the ego trip of just saying like, hey, I don't know this. I'm not an expert here. I mean, especially with coronavirus, a lot of people are trying to make themselves experts. There are very few experts on this subject. You read all these different things. We're still never going to be experts. It takes years and years and years, especially to understand something like this, right? That's right. Reading a Wikipedia article does not make you an expert. You know, no. that's sort of the fundamental point. But a lot of us fall into the trap that I read this article for five minutes. I know everything there is to know. Yeah, I feel like it should just be, listen, I read this thing and it's an entry point into a larger conversation. And it's like, let's talk to people who actually know these things, ask questions and learn that way. And, you know, you mentioned the fact that you had the law background. How did you make the jump from being a lawyer to being an author? Well, you know, it, it's really not as big a jump as you might think. Um, being a lawyer is very much about storytelling. Um, you know, I, I tell people that um, stories are more important um, than just about anything else. Uh, what you're trying to persuade someone, what really matters is whether you have the right story. Uh, that's the way human, human beings are, are, are wired. So even as a lawyer, you know, a lot of um, what I was focusing on was the nature of storytelling and, and, and the techniques for storytelling. How do you actually craft a compelling narrative that convinces people? Um, a lot of times we, we view this as a negative, our tendency to focus on the narrative, to be taken in by compelling narratives. Um, you know, for example, um, abstract numbers and statistics about suffering don't really move us. But if you have a compelling story of an individual uh, and you personalize that account, it, it immediately becomes much more powerful. It, the, the negative side of that tendency is um, our uh, social tendency to want 
victims to humanize themselves, quote unquote. I mean, you know, that should not be necessary. We, we often praise some sort of disaster account by saying that it gave a human face to some abstract suffering. Well, why is that required? Ethically, we should not require victims to perform, to, to, to tell their stories in a compelling way for us before we would give them compassion. We shouldn't. Uh, the, the problem is human beings are not wired that way. We, we are, in fact, wired to, to respond to narratives much more powerfully to abstract notions of ethics and morality. So this leads to, 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 to my great concern with the power of narrative. Um, narratives are extremely important in our society because they are often um, the, the, the fundamental um, force that propels social change. Uh, political candidates don't win by having the best ideas. They win by having the most powerful resonant mythology, the story that gets a lot of people feel like they're part of something. Um, that's, in, in, in many people's view, that's a flaw with the way our system works. But on the other hand, um, sometimes having a powerful story is, is what allows us to actually create change. Um, you, 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 can't, you can't move people to change the status quo by giving them uh, an abstract theory. You have to give them a story, a compelling myth, an epic, in which they can feel they're a part of, uh, of, of a great movement. Um, so narratives are extremely important because they are the only thing sometimes that allows us to actually move forward. Good stories are more powerful than good institutions. Um, and uh, because of that, uh, I, I feel all of us uh, who are interested in social change um, need to pay more attention to narratives, how to construct them, how to, how to make them work better, how to identify their flaws, and, and how to tell more compelling stories for good rather than allow them to be twisted uh for evil ends yeah we've lost the context in those narratives they just become these grand sweeping statements and, and it's really easy to influence people and yeah definitely a lot of really interesting stuff there and your book obviously a ton of interesting stories in there what do you want people to think about when they're reading it because like it feels like we need an escape your world is certainly an escape what are some things to focus on here you know i think all of my stories um they may they may uh, be classified as science fiction uh, or um, dystopian or uh, just sort of philosophical science fiction, but honestly, the only thing I, I really care about in my stories is uh, what does it mean to be human. Uh, that's that's really the fundamental uh, question around which all of my stories uh, are constructed. Um, I, I think these are questions worth asking. Uh, what makes us human? Uh, why do we why do we care? Um, why, what is it, what is it that actually gives life meaning? Um, and, and that's the core of all the stories in the book. Um, whatever it is that um, superficially they may be about, they may be about online trolling, they may be about the singularity, uh, they may even be about the future seven million years from now. But ultimately, uh, the, the core concern is always, what does it mean to be human? And, and how do we remain human even as everything around us change? Definitely some good questions to ask now. Ken, thanks so much for jumping on and we'll talk to you down the road. Thank you very much.